Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics back with a year in words and this time it's for March. So if you're in the club, congratulations by the way from getting for getting that spot. We did sell out of this program. We have some limited kits available. So if you're watching this video um, and you're lucky enough to get one of those remaining kits, scoop that up. They won't last long. Um, but even if you're not buying a kit, I'm going to show you some techniques today of how to make the pinwheel. So this is the second installment of our Yearn Words Club or progression of the 12 projects we'll be rolling through, where each month there'll be applique as well as some piecing techniques. And it's always fun to learn piecing techniques because you can take those into other projects. They don't have to be a wall hanging. So what I'm showing you today will be how to make a pinwheel block with a couple different techniques and you could be sizing those pinwheels to anything you want for future projects. Now today's pinwheel units um, will be four inches finished and we have some really great creative grid tools that are kind of square up tools and I'll show you why they're great as we work through our projects. So if you do have your kit, as always, you know we, we have the fabrics for really everything, even including your backing. So you have your piecing fabrics and then you have your applique. Our pattern right away, as always, is having us start off with taking that big background piece of fabric, in, in this case, kind of a light, pretty bluish teal uh, color, and we're gonna cut that strip, and I think that cut is seven and a half by 25 and a half, and I've done that ahead of time. Just a reminder, and I always put this can out because sometimes I forget to remind you that anytime I'm jumping into a project, I'm now adding even some light sizing to my fabric, especially if I'm gonna be doing piecing because I'm finding that I have more accurate results. And especially if I'm gonna be cutting anything on a bias, that nice sizing on the fabric and a, and a, a generous amount kind of helps stabilize that so the fabric isn't as stretchy which is great because it helps keep my piecing more precise. So just like always, we're gonna have a fresh blade, a fresh needle, good thread, and today I guess we're gonna definitely add some sizing as we're making our pinwheels because we want those points to be able to come out just beautifully. And it seems like when we have that little bit of touch of sizing, that helps out. So let me put that aside. I already did add sizing to my fabric. So as I said, you're cutting your background fabric to the seven and a half by 25 and a half and then from the remainder of that, you'll be cutting some squares, 12 to be exact. And inside the pattern, the measurement is 12 and 7 eighths inch. Now, I want to give you a little pointer. If you like to be able to square up your blocks, which I love that, especially when I just want that precision, what I would encourage you to do and invite you to do, and there's plenty of fabric in your kit to do it, is instead of cutting two and seven eighths inch squares, go ahead and cut three inch squares. So we'll be doing 12 of our pretty kind of light blue tealish color. And of our browns, we have six browns. You'll be cutting, if you want to follow what's inside here, the two and seven eighths or the three inch, as you prefer, three inch gives you something to square up. Two and seven eighths is exactly what they're supposed to be with really no error factor in there. So I know I'm very prone to mistakes and I like to square up. So I'm gonna teach you today um, an option to go ahead and cut those to three inches and that's what I've done here. Once you have those done, I'm gonna show you two different techniques for marking your line from corner to corner and sewing that quarter inch. So basically, the way I learned to make half square triangles, which is what you start with to make a pinwheel, is I grab my two fabrics, always with my light on top so that I can see my drawn line. I grab a straight edge and my marking tool. And this is how I learned, this is probably how you learn. And I just go diagonal to diagonal and draw my line going to my sewing machine. In fact, let's just go do that. I wanna show you what this option is once I come back. And just reminded myself, we're gonna be using the super nonstick needles when we do that applique. Now we've done a little bit of applique on our first unit that we did in February. So we won't be going over that, but I put those on there just to remind myself to mention to you, um, I do piece work 
with the top stitch needle, but when I do machine applique, I like to use the super nonstick. It seems to work really well and is meant for fusible products like fusible webbing. Okay, so I'm going to be sewing a quarter inch away on this side and then pivoting and coming back. That's how I learned how to make half square triangles and probably how you learned that as well. So let's get started. So when you, when you use this technique, the, when you draw the line from corner to corner, it's really on you to get that accurate quarter inch seam allowance. So I'll show you another option in just a moment, and it's a new product from Creative Grid, fairly new. It's been out for just a little bit now. So I, I cut those apart. Now we are just going to warm up that seam, and you know, it doesn't really matter whether you press to the blue or the brown, just be consistent throughout. Whatever you do with that, I'll just go ahead and press to the dark because that's my default. When there's not a reason to press to the light, I press to the dark by default. Okay, that's how I learned how to make half square triangles. And it works, absolutely it works. Cool invention, creative grids, love their products. There's a suite of those products on there. By the way, forgot to mention, you know, at home, I have that six and a half by 24 and a half inch creative grid ruler. So when I cut my background to 20, uh, seven and a half wide, I'm not, my ruler isn't as wide as my fabric. So I have to make that cut and you really use almost my mat to find my seven and a half because my ruler at home is only six and a half. Well, Creative Grid realized that they wanted to offer an option of a wider ruler. This is an eight and a half by 24 and a half. And I love that because there's a lot of blocks that finish at eight inches and ha being able to cut an eight and a half inch strip is fantastic. Or in this case, for us to make our initial cut and still be able to use this ruler to move over to that seven and a half precisely see it on my ruler and make that cut. It's a great option. So if you haven't, if you don't have that eight and a half wide ruler, it may be something for you to consider. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Always giving you options and things to think about is something you might want to add to your sewing room. Okay, Creative Grid, super cool thing. They recognize that it's a lot easier to sew on a drawn line then to have to go seek out that quarter inch line. So cool invention, they have this in two sizes. This is the shorter version, I think that's a nine inch, and I believe the longer ones is a 15. So here, you simply place this corner to corner, and you're going to draw on either, either side of the line, again with your friction pen, and then just sew on the line, right? That's fantastic. So now, We'll still cut it apart. We're still going to press to the dark side. It's just a nice, it's, I'm, I'm always more relaxed when I get to sew on a line versus like, okay, nobody talk to me right now. I have to <laughs> sew exactly a quarter of an inch away from this line. And I find my, pr my precision is a little bit, uh, it, it's not as reliable when I get to stare at a line and all I have to do is sew on that. I sure like that option. Okay, so we're going to just press that. And of course, when we're making our pinwheel unit, we don't want any extra fabric. There's always a lot of fabric coming together in the center of a pinwheel block. And so we don't want to have any extra. Remember how I said that I'm going to teach you how to make a pinwheel unit and you can really make them any size. So here's the rule of thumb. You might want to write this down if you don't already know the rule of thumb. If you want to have a half square triangle finish at say three inches, you will start with three and seven eighths inch square or if you like to square up, just add up, add a whole inch to that. So if you know you want this half, again, I'll say it one more time, if you know you want this to finish, not be raw, finish at three, start with a four inch, and then you'll have something to square up. 
Okay, so that is um, the rule of thumb of basically half square triangles. It's a 7 8 inch rule. Now, once I have this, I want to encourage you to refer to your pattern to make sure that you are laying this out properly. And this will certainly be inside. Or you can just look at the image of your pinwheel, because I have absolutely sewn those together incorrectly. And confirm you have that right. Once you do, we all know that the most important part of a pinwheel, that you're kind of judged on your pinwheels, or kind of you, you're going to feel success, or, or, or hopefully, hopefully you'll feel success when this comes together. When these are off, it's very noticeable. Why am I bringing that up? Because I want, this is the most important part to me, I'm going to start, and look at that lovely interlocking seam right there. I love that. Why I'm bringing this up is, I'm going to start sewing here naturally, but I still want to sew, start sewing here, not here, because this is the part I care most about. So when I bring these right side together like this, I'm going to flip that toward me. Notice these look identical to each other. That way, I'm always starting from my center and traveling out. These are just things I've learned along the way. When I've seam ripped and seam ripped and seam ripped my pinwheels because they weren't coming together in the center, these things will help you have more precision. Okay. Now it's very important that we sew a very accurate quarter inch seam here. Anytime that you're doing precise piecing, having the right pins, patchwork pins. These are incredible. I used to have some pins that were so bulky, they almost disturbed the fabric as I put them in. These are patchwork pins. This is by Clover, and these heads of these pins are glass. So if I inadvertently forget a pin when I'm taking something to an iron, and I make contact with the iron, it's not going to melt, which is really important to me. Now, I like to, at this stage, press this open. I don't want to press to one side or the other. I want to begin to start to distribute my bulk evenly. Here's another thing this does. By opening this seam, do you see this point right here? That delta, that, that is my quarter inch seam and that will be my visual target. So there's a lot of reasons at this point to go ahead and press this open to evenly distribute that bulk and have that visual target when we sew these two sections together of exactly where my needle should be passing through to get that quarter inch seam. So we are going to place these back together again, confirm we have the right position because I could do that, right? I could inadvertently do this wrong, flip the, that's a kind of a cool block, but that's not the block we're going for. <laughs> so just place those back on there, confirm you have the right thing. And once you do, and I'm going to try to keep my head out of the way so you can see this. So I'm stacking and I'm looking here. I'm going to pin in the middle first and get this lined up. And I kind of roll this back. And once I believe those are stacked exactly on top of each other, I'm going to put a pin right along here. I don't want anything moving because I want to hit that intersection. Notice the head of my pin is outside of my quarter inch seam allowance because I don't want to disturb my pins as I sew. When I first started quilting, my pins were out here and I'd have to remove them as I went. It almost destabilizes the, the block. That's why I love to pin on this side and I can now leave my pins in. I'm going to pin one more time. I don't want anything moving on me. All right, let's go to our machine. We're going to sew that quarter inch seam allowance, and that needle should be passing right here. We have our nice visual target there.
Okay, this is the truth moment, right? <laughs> you don't really know till you open it up. Here's the great news. Let's say that my points are off. I don't even know if they are yet. If they're off, I'm gonna grab my seam ripper. This is my best friend and I use it a lot. I have been sewing quilting for my goodness now. I'm embarrassed to say how many years it's been. 25, 26 years now, I use this every single time I sew. So there's no shame in using your seam ripper. That's why they're there. And you know what? We want our blocks to look good. So let's have a look. And I'm happy with that. But if I wasn't happy with that, something may be shifted. Just seam rip it and do it again. All right, so let's go ahead and warm that up and press open again. Now, we know that we are going to square these up. Our pattern has us squaring these up to four and a half. Now, if you cut your fabrics to the two and seven eighths, which is the, is the rule of thumb for half square triangles, that's why the pattern was written that way, there's nothing to square up. It has to be what it is and it should measure four and a half now. But because I upsize that, we will be doing a square up, and wouldn't you know, Creative Grid, being who they are, knew that's a very common block size, and they've made a ruler that has this beautiful circle right in the middle. That's my bullseye, and there's lines here and here to help me line up, as well as diagonal. Now, that's phenomenal. I have line vertical, horizontal, a circle, and a diagonal. I get to line up like four times. I mean, that's exciting to me. <laughs> so let me put this aside. And of course we have our applique. Let's put that aside for the moment. But this is why I love my spinning mat too. Once I start squaring this thing up, I don't have to touch it because I've got the mat to rotate instead of rotating the fabric. So now I'm gonna hold this steady. And I bumped that, and that was me. But that's okay. I've got so much visual alignment, so much here, here, and here, plus my circle. It's very easy to align again. Now, with a pinwheel block, there's a big confluence of fabric coming together. So it's you can, it can seem like the, this is a little bit rocky. There's a lot going on. Let me show you the back side. That's a lot of fabric right there. So if you feel like, why is this kind of rocking? Because it's kind of sitting on kind of a little bit of a, of a hill right now. And that was with us also pressing seams open. So that's, it's very normal. The more bulk that this is kind of riding on, the more you're gonna feel that little bit of rocking. That's why you just need to hold steady push down and even kind of brace that with your hand if you can. Now this is the beauty of oversizing and being able to uh, square those up so that they, they're just perfect. So I love that ability to do that. Now, we went ahead and made our other pinwheels. So one of the other things I wanna encourage you to do, you've got six pinwheel units. So lay them out so that they're in the order and we kind of went dark to light. One thing I've learned over time is rather than sew, certainly you're gonna sew those two together naturally, but I'm not gonna just keep adding one onto that and one onto that. I'm gonna sew those two together, my next two together, and my next two together. It seems to alleviate distortion, and this is gonna be really true throughout our series of whenever you have five and six of something, go ahead and do this, them in pairs and then join them together. Otherwise, sometimes things get this bowing. Why, I don't know, but it just happens. Now, when we get ready to sew them together, just like we did before, 
we're stacking them one on top of the other and you can see that they both have their seams pressed nicely open once again we'll put a pin right in here we have some nice interlocking seams over there pressing is such an important thing because that's what's giving me one seam going here and one seam going here that makes everything lay flatter so let's just go so that i just want to show you how good pinning and pressing gives you beautiful results. Okay, so let's just remove our pins and Let's see how we did. Isn't that nice? It, the pins, you know what I'm noticing about my quilting as years have gone on? Things that I kind of thought, uh, I, use a, I use a needle till it breaks. You know, I, I use a rotary cutter blade well past when I, when I should have changed it. Um, inexpensive pins. These things all just, I, as time has marched on, I have figured out that ingredients really matter and um, and my piecing has gotten better, certainly just with time because I've done it more, but I'm also using higher quality products and that has played a significant role. So treat yourself to those things when you know that's like, huh, that blade's getting a little dull. Eh, move on, right? Okay, so now we would do the two and the two and sew them all together. That's going to give you a certain length and just take note of what that is. All right, let me put that aside for now. Now remember in our first video, which was much longer, we went through cutting the background, how to use the uh, applique pressing sheet in conjunction with the light box to pre-assemble certain units and then bring them onto the background. That's the part that's gonna be really very much the same each and every time with the piecing being different. So just a quick reminder, you, you have your two diagrams and of course your arrows here to tape those together to align those. The biggest wafer three is ideal because it, now it really covers the whole span of this. This is the smaller wafer two. So just to uh, reduce space, this is just a reminder. This is a great uh, use of the light box so that when you do place your background fabric, you know, you've got your light box, you have your applique diagram, and the sheet. It's a great way to be able to use those in conjunction. Now here, there's very few things actually that require the applique pressing sheet. You're not gonna ever put the FAM, you know, I or the cloud on the applique pressing sheet because they're not layered. Those things may be pre-doing the birds so that their wings are on. Maybe this unit right here is a nice thing to pre um, pre-assemble but you could see this one it doesn't have quite the complex layering that we had with the February one so you may or may not have as much use for the applique pressing sheet this time but always great to be able to use just this in here I can just bring this over just a reminder in case you didn't see that first video and again I would I would be grabbing for the wafer three which is bigger this one, you know, I'd want to turn this at least to the side. So if you're like, I'd like to see how they do that. Of course, this would be taped together and you can see this is much longer than my um, light box, but my background is fitting right inside that box. So we made it very easy for you. So, hey, here's an idea. Even if you're gonna do the wafer two, it's okay to have your, um, be able to put your shapes down here, do the first portion of it, move it off to the side, iron them down, and then kind of scoot this up, bring in the second diagram. So you can make do with what you have. I certainly did that for years before I had a big light box. You'll get all of your applique down. And of course, we have our year and word thread set. So if you wanna be able to stitch that down, this is for all 12 of the programs. So whether you're in the club or buying kits individually, this will cover you for all of those. And that's just beautiful thread to have 50 weight cotton. Who doesn't need a lot of beautiful 
thread in their sewing room for applique, you'll stitch everything down. Now, getting back to the pinwheel unit, before you cut this down to size, you're gonna wanna say, okay, how long is my pinwheel unit all pressed out? Go ahead and cut your applique unit to be that same length, and then you'll simply join them together, bringing in your batting, backing, go ahead and do whatever cool thing you wanna do, and then bind your project, of course, with the Wonder Clips and whatever your favorite technique is to finish up that project for binding. So you've learned today how to use pinwheels. We can do the way we both learned, if you learned that way, or maybe this is the first time you've learned how to make pinwheels with or without the Creative Grid tool, and that awesome four and a half inch square up with the spinning mat is a great combination. And again, we will be cutting our backgrounds all throughout the program to that same size of seven and a half by 25, I think 25 and a half, let me check that measurement. Yes, and so if you don't have that eight and a half inch ruler yet, it may be something that you wanna think about grabbing because we're gonna be cutting them all to the same size uh, for our applique. So we'll be getting ourselves ready to go. More piecing coming up, a little more uh, intricate for the month of April. So hey, by the way, share us, share the good news of Shabby Fabrics with a friend. Maybe that you've got someone that uh, isn't aware of our tutorials and it's great news to share with a friend. So I'll see you uh, next month where we'll be uh, learning how to piece some tulips with some leaves. A lot of fun. I'll see you next month.